Well, good morning. Good morning, church. We want to welcome you this morning to our online service. Uh, to be honest, this is a little bit awkward for us to be leading worship uh, to literally no one um, here. But, you know, this is the season that we're in as a church and as a community. And so um, it's still a time that we lift up the name of the Lord above all names. It's still a time that we worship him. And so we're going to do that this morning together. And so let's worship him.
but he brought me into his love for me. Oh, his love for me. The sun sets free. Oh, it's free. God, we thank you for this time that we have, that we can come together remotely all across our community and worship you with one voice. And so, God, we cling to your promises this morning. God, we are so thankful for your promises, that you're here, that you're among your people, that you are at work, that you don't forget us. And God, I pray that we can proclaim that this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. You unravel me with melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. 
Good morning, I'm Tyann Hayes. I work at Love Inc. And my husband, Tony, and I have been attending Suburban for about 11 years. And like all of you, we feel like we've been on a roller coaster as our world has changed from day to day with news updates. The TV was on in the background this morning and it announced that there's a large need for blood donations through the Red Cross at this time. The mention of the Red Cross got me thinking about my dad. Growing up on Kodiak, Alaska, I learned about sacrifice and service from my dad, who served as the mayor of our island for 24 years, at the same time that he served many other boards and organizations. One of those organizations was the National Red Cross Board of Directors. Dad sacrificed his time with his family to serve on the Red Cross Board by traveling to DC frequently for meetings. The time he spent with the National Red Cross was difficult. At one meeting, Vice President Cheney interrupted them to tell them that the U.S. was going to war and the need for blood would increase. Dad was on the board when the AIDS epidemic began to spread and the Red Cross needed new processes and testing to protect donors and maintain the integrity of the blood supply. My dad doesn't talk much about himself, but I absorbed his desire to want to serve and to help others by giving blood. I just think that if you can, then you should. 
As a result, I mark my calendar so that every eight weeks, I, rem I am reminded to go online and search for a local blood drive. So last week, as I sat in the comfortable chair in the mobile unit, watching the blood drain out of my arm, I began to think of how precious it is and how Jesus gave his blood for us. Jesus' sacrifice of blood wasn't done in a comfortable chair over 30 minutes, but he lived his whole life as a sacrifice and died an excruciating death because he wanted to see us live a full life in relationship with God. Blood is such a precious resource. We can only receive life-giving blood through the sacrificial giving of another person. Having that extra blood inside me does me no extra good, but it can save the life of someone who needs it. In fact, one donation of blood can save three lives. It can give hope to someone who is, in desperate, who is desperate and in need and afraid. Jesus' blood did that for us. Sometimes when we sit in a church pew, we can start to think that the sinners are outside those doors. But the truth is that every single one of us struggles with some kind of sin that we can only overcome with reliance on Jesus. We cannot do it on our own, and that's why he sacrificed himself so that his blood could redeem us, so that we can live a life of freedom, telling others that there is blood for them too. As we prepare to take communion together, let's think about that, about the need we each have for an ongoing connection to Christ's love and power, and about the fact that we have the chance to share about the love and grace we have found in him with others. In just a moment, we're going to give you all some time and space to take communion. After I pray, the musicians will play instrumental music for about 90 seconds, and if you're prepared to take communion, you can do so during that time. If you don't take communion for any reason, we encourage you to just take this time to reflect on the amazing gifts that God offers all of us through his son, Jesus. Let's pray. Father, as we reflect on the sacrifice of your son today, would you give us a spirit of hope? Would you confirm in us that your plans are for good, would you encourage each and every one of us living through this time of uncertainty? We pray for your will to be done, but we do desire an end to the spreading of this virus and for health and safety for those vulnerable and affected. This is not a surprise to you. Would the outcome of this time in history result in a strengthening of your people and your church as a non-anxious presence in a world that is prone to fear? Thank you for sending your son. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. seen this chorus a couple of times together turn your eyes upon Jesus so
Good morning. As I look out on all these empty chairs, I'm reminded of how much I miss seeing you all on Sunday. I miss greeting you with a handshake or a hug and a smile. And I miss you because you are the best part of church. You are why we're here. We're thinking of you, we're praying for you, we miss you. The doors might be closed on this building today, but we did not close church. You were the church. Right now your home is the church. This pandemic didn't close suburban, it just opened hundreds of satellite locations all over the valley. You can be the church, right there in your home with your family, with your friends and your neighbors. This is a unique season, but the work of the church is going forward and we have several things that we wanna make sure we communicate with you. We're increasing our online presence. To go along with our 30-day reading plan, we're posting short videos from the pastoral staff on Facebook and YouTube. Please follow our Suburban Facebook page and subscribe to our YouTube channel to make sure that you don't miss those videos. We're also sending out notifications through our Suburban app and we encourage you to get the app if you haven't already. This pandemic has not and will not stop the work of the church. In fact, it has just given us more opportunities to love people in the name of Christ. It has opened new doors for us to reach out and check on neighbors and friends. We are working on ways to care for people in our church and community. We have a system in place, so if you know of people in need, please call the church. And if you want to volunteer, let us know. But please feel free to meet needs on your own. We don't have to be involved. You're welcome to do this on your own. Good Friday and Easter are coming up, and it's looking more and more likely that we will not be able to celebrate those things in person together, but we will find a way to celebrate, and we'll let you know more details on that soon. We realize that we may have new people joining us today online. Welcome. If you are new, we would love to hear from you and know that you're there and get you more information about our church, and you can do that by going to our website and filling out a connection card. Connection card is also a great way for you to let us know what we can be praying for with you. So anyone's welcome to get on there and uh, let us know your prayer requests. Our staff loves praying for you and hearing from you. So please do that today. This is the part of our service where we typically take the offering. With our online service, we're encouraging you to give online. Last week, our online giving was up, so I know more of you are figuring out how to do that. Thank you. We recognize that with this current change to our economy, some people in our church will likely feel the impact of that and we wanna be ready to help. So for those of you who can give above and beyond right now, we encourage you to do that online. So we are equipped to help and care. Let's pray together. Father God, the world feels like it's spinning out of control. It seems like everything has changed, but not you. You're as steady as ever. In the face of all the uncertainty in the world right now, you are still sovereign. You are still in control. God, I pray as people are facing their fears and uncertainty in this time that they turn to you. Psalm 121 says, I lift my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. May we look to you in these times of trouble. As we feel less and less in control of our lives, may we give you more and more control. God, there are so many people in the world grieving right now grieving the loss of a loved one, the loss of their normal lives, the loss of a trip or an event they were looking forward to, the loss of a job or of security, the loss of freedom of social interaction. God, we give you our grief and we ask you to bring comfort and peace as only you can. God, we know that you are near to the brokenhearted. In this time where people are not able to be physically near to one another, we ask you to be near to us. Help those feeling isolated and afraid Help them know who, that you are near. To paraphrase Romans 8, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or pandemic? No, neither death nor life, neither the present nor the future, neither height nor depth or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God. God, we ask you to reassure us in these uncertain times to draw us near you, to pour out your love in unexpected ways, to show us that you are in control. God, we look to you. May the world look to you. Lord, we lift up other churches in our area who are figuring out how to reach your people under these new constraints. We pray especially for Northside Church and their pastor, Jamie Mills, as their church is still so new that you use this experience to bond them together as family. 
that you help them to care for each other and love each other well in this time, and that you use them to reach their community, and that they are stronger on the other side of this than they were at the start. Strengthen them and provide for them. Lord, we lift this offering up to you. We know that everything we have is because of your blessing and goodness, and so we humbly give back to you. Help us to grow in generosity and to be cheerful givers. God, as people's needs grow in this time, will you provide for them? Will you equip our church to meet the needs around us for your name and your glory? God, even, as, even with everything going on, we have so much to be thankful for, you most of all. We are thankful for the technology that brings us together today. We ask you to bless Mike as he shares his word, your word with us. Please bless our church family today. We love you, Lord. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, I hope that you are awake and you've grabbed some coffee and you're ready to go because we are going to cover a lot of ground this morning uh, in the Old Testament. So we are in the second week of this sermon series, The Story, where we are working together through the story of the Bible as a whole. And the goal in this series is pretty simple. Between now and Easter, we want to take kind of a 30,000-foot view of the biblical story so that by the time we get to Easter, we can really celebrate it because we will see and understand just how the resurrection fits in with everything else. Else. And to help us as a church do that, we created a 30-day reading plan that we're encouraging people to be reading along with during the week. And if you haven't had a chance to start that yet, it is not too late to jump in. Uh, you can sign up for the Daily Devotions on Suburban's app, and you'll get it delivered to your phone every morning. Or you can go to our website, and you can download a PDF of the reading plan there. And now one kind of new thing that we're trying to help us stay connected in this unique season is that every day uh, someone on the pastoral staff is recording just a really short, like a two or three minute video of some reflection on the daily reading and also a single uh, prayer point, something that we can be joining together with in prayer that day. And as a staff, we were talking this week and we had that idea on Wednesday morning. So I rushed to my office. I was like, well, I'll do the first one. And I recorded the first of those videos that we put up Monday. So let's just watch a, a little bit of that now so you can see what it's like. Well, hey everyone. Uh, the staff and leaders here at Suburban are gonna be trying something new to help us stay connected during this very strange season that we're all living in. So yeah, I know it's kind of budget. Uh, I recorded it in my office and it probably would have been better to have somebody else actually hold the camera and do that for me. Maybe they could have picked a more flattering camera angle. Well, anyway, needless to say, about 30 seconds after we put that up online, uh, some of the fine people that I work with began to give me a hard time about it. So just a few minutes later, uh, someone actually suggested that it looked a little bit like this. If you guys remember that old movie, The Blair Witch Project, you know, where they're, oh, they're in the woods. So somebody said it was like that. And then later that night, Eric Simmons, who has way too much time on his hands right now, sent out this version of the video that he made. Well, hey, everyone. Uh, the staff and leaders here at Suburban are going to be trying something new. So apparently something about how I recorded that video reminded him of like some budget sci-fi horror movie of people who are trapped in a lunar base or something like that. So just know, moving forward, I am encouraging people on staff to get some help in recording the video so they don't look like it's something out of a hostage situation. Uh, but again, if you're interested in getting those, we're sending out notifications every day around the lunch hour just to let you know when those videos are up so that you can read that and be praying with us. They're, they're things we're trying to do tied to this reading plan to stay connected to together in this season. And in our readings this week in the reading plan, like I mentioned, we covered a lot of ground. Uh, we looked at some stories from the Old Testament that cover the span of several hundred years. And when you move that quickly through the story of the Old Testament, it can be kind of easy to get lost in there. And I think a lot of people, even if they've been in the church for a while, we have a tendency to, to kind of get confused and lose our place in the Old Testament. And uh, well, let me give you an example of that. I, I had a professor once in seminary who, in, she said in her experience, most people's understanding of the Old Testament was that it was a lot like a college dorm room. Um, I don't know what your college dorm room was like. I actually have a picture of my college dorm room. We'll put it up on the screen. This is it. Um, did anybody else have a room that looked like that? I mean, it's pretty much just this chaotic, jumbled mess, right? There's no organization. There's no system. Everything's just kind of lumped on top of each other. And if it was time to get dressed and get out of door in a hurry, it was pretty hard to find what I was looking for. And I think for a number of us, that's kind of what our understanding of the Old Testament is like. It's this jumbled mess, right, my, like my dorm room. I mean, we, we know some stories here from Sunday school, and, you know, we remember the names of some characters, but, but we don't know the arc of the big story well enough to know how they relate to each other, 
to know how all those different pieces fit together and are organized. So what I want to do this morning is try to give you an overview of the Old Testament in such a way that, that helps you put it all together so that when we do these daily readings, you'll understand, okay, what part of the story are we at? Where does this fit into that? And more importantly, how do all of these readings eventually point us towards Jesus? And I'll be the first to admit that is a pretty tall order uh, because the Old Testament is a really, really long and complex book. Uh, so to help us do that, I wanna actually use an idea. I wanna use the idea of a covenant to help us organize the events of the Old Testament. And what I would argue this morning is that this idea of covenants, that, that is one of the major structural devices that the Bible uses to build its story. And if you need proof of that, here's what you need to do. You need to look no further than the actual Bible that you're holding. So if you've got a physical Bible with you, go ahead and open it up to the table of contents. Like right there at the beginning, a table of contents, list all the books. Now, if your Bible is anything like mine, your table of contents sort of neatly organizes and divides the books of the Bible up into two different groups, right? And what does it call them? It calls them the New and the Old Testament. Yeah, the Old Testament and the New Testament. But here's the thing. A better way to translate that would be to call them the Old and the New Covenant. Because the word behind the English word that gets translated there as testament is the Greek word diatheke, which is a translation of the Hebrew word berit, which means covenant. So the understanding of the people who first took all the different inspired books of the Bible and organized them and put them in the order that we have them today was based on this idea of covenants. Because they understood that these organizations, that the part of the story that they reflected, they reflected these two different covenants, the old and the new, these different ways that God was relating and interacting to his people. So covenants are a big deal. But that might get you sort of asking the question, okay, well, okay, covenants are a big deal, but, but what is a covenant? And covenant is a word that I think when it, when it gets used in English today, most of the time it's used in a religious setting, like in a church service like this. So people think, oh, well, I guess covenants have probably always been religious words. Ah, but that's not the case. You see, back in the day in the world of the Old Testament, covenants were all over the place and they weren't specifically religious. In fact, you know where covenants most often showed up? They showed up in business interactions and like international treaties and relationships. So here's how one historian described or defined a covenant. He said that a covenant is an agreement enacted between two parties in which one or both make promises under oath to perform or refrain from certain actions stipulated in advance. Now, if that sounds like something that a lawyer would write in a contract, there's a good reason for that. Because that's what covenants were. They were basically contracts, right? You and I, if you've ever rented an apartment, if you've ever bought a car, if you've ever gotten married, in many ways, you have signed a covenant. Because a covenant is a lot like a contract that we would have in our world today, right? It sets out, okay, how is this relationship going to work? So like, think about that, the contract that maybe you signed when you rented an apartment, right? There were some, some, it defined the relationships. It said, okay, if you pay X amount of money per month, you get to live here. And it also lists out what are the consequences if you don't follow through with it, right? If you don't give me your rent money by the 15th, you get evicted, or there is a fine, and you have to pay more. That's how covenants work. They define things. And that's what covenants in general were. And they are everywhere in the Old Testament world. And there are lots of different kinds of covenants. But, but for our purposes today, what we're doing, we need to just focus on one specific type of covenant. And it's what historians call a suzerain vassal treaty. Okay, which is, is sort of a fancy word, um, but it's just a fancy way of saying it's an agreement between a really powerful party and a not quite as powerful party, right? The suzerain is a word that means this powerful part of the deal, and the vassal is the person who's not quite as powerful. And this kind of, of agreement, this particular kind of covenant, was very common, especially in the part of the world where the Old Testament was written. Because think about the land that the, the patriarchs lived in, right? The, the land of what we know as modern-day Israel. It did not have a lot going for it in terms of natural resources. But it was at a very, very critical place geographically, right? Some major trade routes happened to crisscross right there in the land. So because of that, the, the different superpowers of the day, as powers, as empires rose and fell, they were always very interested in being in charge of this land, and they would often fight over it. So if you were, you know, a little kingdom that maybe just owned a little piece of this land, one of the things that it would be very common for you to do when one superpower is starting to threaten you would be enter into one of these kind of covenant agreements with one of the other superpowers so that they would protect you from their aggression. And just like our rent contract today has stipulations and, you know, if you do this, you do that, these covenants had promises on both ends. 
oftentimes the more powerful party would agree to protect you. Like, hey, if somebody attacks you, we will send our army to have your back. And the lesser power ended up having to pay, usually a yearly tribute. And if they didn't pay up, there were some stipulations in the covenant about what the penalties would be, and they go way beyond like just the, the late fee that you would have for your rent. So let me give you just one example of how this works. Um, historians, archaeologists years ago, they, they came across these things. And, and so this is, this is an actual covenant that was written around 1200 BC in this part of the world. And it's a relationship between a vassal who's got a great name, if you're pregnant, if you're looking for a baby's name. His name is Dupi Teshub. And this is what he owed his suzerain, the greater power, a guy named Merciless. So every year... He had to pay Merciless 300 shekels of refined and first-class gold. And what he got in exchange for that was military protection. But listen to what the document says is going to happen if old Dupi Teshub doesn't come through on his end of the deal and pay up. It says this. It says, May these gods of the oath destroy Dupi Teshub together with his person and his wife and his son and his grandson and his house and his land and together with everything he owns. Right? So the bottom line, you don't want to, to not honor your part of the contract with this guy. And this is just one example, but it's a great example of the kinds of covenants that were being made and broken all the time in this part of the world, in the very age when the Old Testament books were being written. So that's what covenants are. And I wanted to spend time kind of giving that historical background and talking about how they worked. Because it turns out, when you look at the different covenants that God enters into in the Old Testament with the people of Israel, they work very much like that. They follow the same basic format that you see in these other historical covenants. In fact, they use a lot of the same structure and language. Really what you see is that God enters into a suzerain vassal treaty with the people of Israel, right? Often through one of their leaders, through uh, Moses or David, people who represent them. Right? If you think about it, God is the suzerain, right? He is the greater party. And he promises that he will protect and help and save. And the people of Israel, the vassal, the weaker party, right? They promise to obey and to faithfully follow God. That's their part of the deal. And it's this idea of covenants that once we begin to understand that, we really can begin to understand the big picture of the Old Testament. Because you can divide the story of the Old Testament up using these different covenants that God made with Israel. Each covenant is almost like the, the title page in a new chapter of the story of what God is doing in the world. So let's take a minute, let's look at one of these to see how this works. So to get started, if you can, I want to invite you to turn with me in the Bible to Genesis chapter 15. That's the, the first text we're going to look at today. So the Bible tells the story of God's work in the world, right? It starts with the creation of the world, and creation is good. And in the beginning, the relationship between God and humanity and, and humans and each other in the world, everything is, is just great. It was perfect. And then, of course, humanity rebels. And in Genesis 3, the consequences of that rebellion are spelled out. But even at that low point, as God is telling them what the consequences will be, he makes a promise, he promises that one day, one of the, the seed of the woman, right, one of Eve and Adam's children is going to rise up and will crush the serpent, will crush the power of death once and for all and bring humanity back to God. So he makes that promise in Genesis 3. And then in Genesis 12, he begins to set the plan in motion. He picks out one man, Abraham, and he enters into this covenant with him. So this is what we're looking at this morning, this covenant. Because in Genesis 12, God makes a promise to Abraham. He says, Abraham, I'm going to make you a great nation. You don't have any kids now, but your family tree is going to be enormous, and I'm going to give you land, and I'm going to bless the whole world through you. And, and there's a lot that's wrapped up in that, but the thing that I want us to see is that that first covenant promise really centers around family. God promises to give childless Abraham a family. That's his part of the promise. And the only thing that Abraham has to do is to step out in faith and go to the land that God tells him to do, and Abraham does that. Um, but there's a problem, right? Abraham goes and he obeys, but, but years start to go by and Abraham and his wife still can't have kids. So in Genesis 15, the passage that we're looking at, Abraham kind of brings that up to God. You know, it's like, hey, you know, God, I, I hate to bring this up, but you know that promise you made? Like, my wife's not getting any younger and we're not seeing a baby here. So in the scene that we're looking at, God renews the covenant with Abraham and he, and he formalizes it using the common practices of that day. So look at verse 5. Here's where God kind of reaffirms his side of the deal. He says, Abraham, look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can even do that. And then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. That's his part, the promise that he's going to have just countless children. 
And the next verse, again, Abraham does his part. He trusts God. Verse 6 says, Abraham believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. But then, then God does something that seems so completely bizarre until you understand how covenants worked back in this day and age. So what he does, he says this. Look, look starting in verse 8. So Abraham's like, well, God, how, how do I know that I'm going to gain possession of the land? Because he talks about the land there too. So look what the Lord says. He says, the Lord said to him, bring me a heifer, a goat, and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. So Abraham brought all these to them, cut them in half, and arranged the halves opposite each other. Okay, what in the world is going on here? What, you know, see, like he's got this bloody alley set up with these animal parts on both sides. And again, here is where learning a little bit more about the, the practices of making a covenant in the ancient Near East can really help us understand what God's trying to communicate. So the phrase that, that gets translated from the Hebrew in the English when we read it, that God made a covenant, the actual phrase in Hebrew that it's used, the literal translation is to cut a covenant. And they use that language on purpose because these covenants were often ratified with the sacrifice of animals. And here's how that would work. Um, as the treaty is about to be finalized, the weaker party, right, the vassal, would be responsible for bringing all these animals and sacrificing them, cutting them in half and, and sort of laying them, you know, one side here, one side there. And then to ratify the treaty, what the, the weaker party would do is they would walk through this valley. They would walk through the blood of the animals while they are reciting their promises. They're reciting kind of their part of the deal and what it is that they say they're supposed to be doing. And really, if you think about it, it's this crazy visual picture of them saying, may what has happened to these animals happen to me if I don't follow through on my side of this deal. And just to let you know, I mean, this is very common in that day. In fact, God uses this same language at another point in the Bible. In the book of Jeremiah, he's describing what covenant-breaking consequences are like. And he says this. He says, those who have violated my covenant and have not fulfilled the terms of the covenant they made before me, I will treat them like the calf they cut in two and then walked between its pieces. Right? So that's how these ceremonies often worked. The weaker party, right? the one who is going to bear the penalty if the covenant was broken, would pass through the bloody parts. But this is where it gets so crazy. Look what happens in Genesis 15. You don't want to miss this. This is so important. So Abraham, before he has a chance to do this, to, to walk through the parts and say his part, Abraham falls asleep. And he has a vision where he sees God appear as this sort of flaming torch. And look what it says. It says, when the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared, that's God, and it passed between the pieces. Now think about what that means. I love the way that a scholar talked about the significance of this moment. She says this. She says, who by his actions announced, may what has happened to these animals happen to me if I fail to keep my oath? Not the weaker party. Rather, it is the Lord of the cosmos who traversed the bloody alley in order to announce to Abraham and his offspring that he would not fail. Right? God is saying, look, if you end up breaking the covenant, Abraham, it's not you who's going to bear the punishment. It's not your children who will bear the punishment. I myself will bear the penalty and will have my flesh torn in order to make sure that this contract is fulfilled, in order to make sure that people have a way back to God. Now, if that sounds familiar, it's because even here on like page 10 or 12 of the Bible, you're already seeing indications of where the story is going you're already seeing a picture of how one day, ultimately, it's going to be God's own son who will bear the penalty for our sins in his body and put us back in a right relationship with God. Just tuck that idea away for a second because we're, we're going to come back to that. Um, but that's what I see. That, that's kind of the first of the covenants that can help us organize our way through the Old Testament. In it, God promises to provide Abraham with a family. And all of the stories that follow that covenant in the rest of the book, they're about God following through on that promise and giving Abraham a family. So all throughout the book of Genesis, Abraham's family tree grows until they become a nation, a nation that ends up spending 400 years in slavery in Egypt until God rescues them in this miraculous way. And, and if you were here last week watching, uh, Jesse preached about that. Remember about how God heard the cries while they were in Egypt and he stepped in to rescue them? And then after God rescues them from Egypt, he enters into a second covenant with them, a new covenant with them. And this is the second one that I think we can use to help organize our thoughts and our, our journey through the Old Testament. So the first one was, I think, primarily about God giving Abraham a family. 
But the second one kind of goes beyond that. Because in this one, God is promising to live a homeland for that family. And he's promising to be with and live with the people there and bless them there. And God says, I'm gonna do this for a reason. I'm gonna do this because ultimately, I want my message of hope and grace and salvation to go out to the whole world, but we need a place to do that from. So I'm gonna give you a land and I'm gonna bless you and my blessing will go out to all the nations from there. That's what God promises to do. And again, he's only gonna do this if they keep up with their side of the covenant. If they stay faithful to him and they worship him and don't start serving other gods. And again, there's one moment, I think, in particular when God is is ratifying this covenant. This time he does it through Moses. That I I think if we understand a little bit more about ancient covenants, it just helps us get a fuller picture of what's going on here. Uh, So, for example, in in our reading plan this week on Monday, we read the passage where God gave the Ten Commandments, right? This famous passage, Exodus 20, God's making this new uh, covenant with Moses. And about ten chapters later, when that experience on the mountain is over, it, it says this. Moses is getting ready to come down. And the text says that Moses turned and went down the mountain with the two tablets of the covenant law in his hands. They were inscribed on both sides, front and back. Now, I don't know about you, but I I wonder about this kind of thing. Have you ever stopped and wondered why Moses has two different tablets? And did you ever wonder what was written on them? Well, the answer that most people think of is the answer that you see, like, have you ever seen Charlton Heston as Moses in the Ten Commandments, right? It's this idea, tradition pictures it that way. There's two tablets, and each of them have five of the Ten Commandments written on them. The idea is that Moses is carrying this down. It's like a visual aid to tell the people of Israel what they've done. But I don't think that's what's going on. And if you pay close attention, that's not actually what the text says either. The text says he's got two different tablets, each with writing on both sides, So it's not like one tablet has five and the other tablet has the other five. In fact, if you wanted to, you wouldn't need two different tablets to write out all the words of the Ten Commandments. There's not that many words in Hebrew that make them up. You could easily fit them on one side of just one tablet. But Moses has got two tablets with writing on both sides of them. So why does he have these, right? What are these things? Well, here's what they were. After a covenant was finalized, you know, with the oaths and the walking through all the chopped up animals and all that part, each of the different parties would take a written summary of the covenant home with them and they would place that in the temple of the God that they were swearing the oaths to while they were finalizing the covenant, right? And it was there as a reminder of what they've done. And that's what's going on here, I think. Moses has two tablets because he just made a covenant with God. And those two tablets are the two copies of the covenant terms. He's got both parties' summary of that. And he has that for a reason because what is it that God has promised to do in this covenant? He's promised to live with the people of Israel. His presence is going to be with them. So God's copy of the covenant, it's not like he needs one. It doesn't need to go somewhere else. It needs to go and be stored with the one of Moses because God says, I'm gonna be there with you. And Moses gets that. So he takes both of the tablets and he puts them in the Ark of the Covenant. And later when the people of Israel end up getting a land of their own and they build a temple, they store these two tablets there. I mean, think about what these means. These two tablets hold a central place, literally and geographically as well, in the life of Israel. And they become a core part of the identity of the people of Israel because they're reminders that God has promised to give them a land and to be with them in that land and to bless them as long as they simply obey him and follow him. So all the next set of stories that we have in the Old Testament They're about Israel living under this covenant, right? About how eventually they do come to the land that God had promised them. And and under Joshua, they go in and they conquer the land. And things are good for a while, but they don't stay faithful to God. Oftentimes over the years, they go their own way and then they're oppressed by people on the outside. So they cry out to God and he sends these military leaders called judges to help them. And this cycle keeps going until eventually the people of Israel just kind of throw up their hands and they're like, God, we don't really want you to be in charge anymore. Not in a direct way would you please just give us a king like every other nation has? And the rest of the stories that we read this week in the reading plan, they all come from from this part of the story, this part of the history of Israel. And, you know, one of the things that I think these stories show us is that the people of Israel back then are a lot like you and me today. I mean, the people back then, they were so forgetful. Even though they lived literally with these two copies of the covenant summary right there in the midst of them, reminding them that God promised to live with them, that God promised to bless them, they were just so quick to forget that God was there. And they were so quick to forget how much they needed him, 
how much they needed him to guard them and to lead them and to provide for them. They, they were often quick to forget the promises that God had made and instead they would just do whatever seemed right in their own eyes. And it was only when external threats showed up, when they started getting pressure from the outside, when the illusion that they were really in control of things started to disappear, that's when they would turn back to God. And you know what really struck me as I was reading through these stories this week is how little things have changed. I mean, we are really forgetful too, aren't we? We tend to think that we are masters of our own fate and we are, you know, we've got a 401k, we've got a plan, we're in control of our lives. And we think that. Until events like the events of the last few weeks kind of pull the rug out from underneath us and remind us of how little control we actually have over our lives and over our world and how fragile our life and some of the social structures around us are. In, in that sense, you know, I've been encouraged reading these stories because when I've realized that we're in the same bind that these people were in, I realized that we can learn from them and learn from the lessons. And, and hopefully as you were reading this week, God did speak to you and give you some lessons that you can apply in your life. Um, okay, but so, so let's go back to the story, right? So God has given Abraham big family tree, right? Covenant promise number one, check, he's made that one. And now he's living with the people in the land, right? And he's given that to him. So covenant promise number two, check, did that one too. So God's kept up his end of the deal, but all along, humanity has not been keeping up their end of the deal, right? Even Abraham's children, they are a mess and they routinely ignore God and forget him and go their own way. But God still fulfills that first promise to make them a great nation. And then all throughout these other books, right, God is with the people, but the people of Israel, they don't follow his laws, but even with that, God fulfills promise number two. But, but there's an issue here, right? They're not doing what they're supposed to do. So what comes next? God's desire has not changed. He wants every single person to live the full and free life that he created them to live. To once again live in those restored relationships, the right relationship with him and with each other and with the world around them that we were created to live in Genesis. But it's getting pretty clear at this point in the story that people aren't going to be able to pull this off on their own that they cannot live the lives God created them to live. They need some help that will come from outside themselves to do that. And that leads us to the third Old Testament covenant that we need to look at. It's a covenant that God makes with a man named David who was one of the early kings of Israel. So look at this promise that God makes to him in 2 Samuel chapter 7. He says this. He says, David, when your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. My love will never be taken away from him as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed before you. And listen to this. It says, your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. So with these words, God is promising that a day will come when one of David's descendants will be anointed as God's king and will rule forever. And it's from that Hebrew word for anointed one, the word Mashiach, that we get the word Messiah, right? God promises that one day a descendant of David will come and that person, the Messiah, is gonna rule forever and he's gonna restore things and he's gonna bring about justice and he's gonna help people do what they are not able to do on their own, to obey they're part of the covenant, to honor God with their whole lives. So that's this promise that one day that Messiah is gonna come. But until that promise is fulfilled, the people of Israel, they just keep falling short of the mark. So what I'm gonna walk you through next is the background for the readings that we'll be doing this week coming up. So beginning even with David's own life, like David does some good things, but near the end of his life, he commits adultery and murder and things just start going downhill. So his son Solomon builds the temple and things start off well, but Solomon eventually just gets consumed by his own pride and power. And as a result, God says to him, hey, because you have not kept my covenant and laws, I will surely tear the kingdom from you and give it to your servant. Pretty soon after he dies, civil war breaks out and the nation is divided into two kingdoms that are often at war with each other. And in the years that follow, the people in these two kingdoms, they routinely turn their back on God and they ignore the words of the many Old Testament prophets that are active at this time. These are men who reminded the people that it is not too late to return to God. It is not too late to come back and actually live out your side of the covenant. But their voices are largely ignored. And after 200 years of ignoring him, God is true to his word. 
And in 722 BC, the Assyrian army tears through the land and wipes out the northern kingdom of Israel. Uh, The southern kingdom hangs on a little bit longer, but in 586 BC, the Babylonian army rolls through and destroys most of the land, sacks the city of Jerusalem, and carries most of the survivors off into exile. And after 70 years of being in exile, the, the Babylonian king allows some of the refugees to return, and then the Old Testament ends. And, you know, it ends in a pretty dark place, right? The people of Israel, they have broken their side of the covenant over and over and over again. And God has made this promise to David, and we don't know how he is going to honor it. So the Old Testament ends with these broken people, and they're left, and they're waiting. But they are waiting with hope. Because they remember, they're still living under this third covenant that God has promised to one day send a forever leader who can help them truly live out God's will. And as they wait, they they cling, they get hope from the promises of of some of the prophets like Isaiah who would say things to remind people of this thing. He's a prophet who said that the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace. And listen to this language, it goes right back to that covenant. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, from then on, and forevermore. So that's the hope, right? That's the hope that fills these people as they wait. It's a hope that ultimately finds fulfillment in Jesus because Jesus is born from the family line of David. So he is the one, the seed who's gonna conquer death once and for all, the seed of the woman promised in Genesis 3. But how exactly is Jesus gonna end up fulfilling God's part of the covenants, the contracts that he made? Well, again, go back to Genesis 15. Which party walked through the animals? Which party said, I am willing to have my own flesh torn if these promises are not kept? It wasn't Abraham who said that. He was asleep. No, it was God. It was God himself who passed through those slaughtered animals. God was so committed to fulfilling the promises that he made to his people that he said he would bear the price if the covenant was broken. He would do what it took to make it right and put people back in a right relationship with God. And what happened when he sent his son Jesus into the world? It's what Tyen was talking about uh, during our communion meditation. He sacrificed himself, right? It was his blood that helped God come through on that promise. It was Jesus' own body that was torn in order to put these broken covenants, these broken contracts back together. Right? Even in the opening chapters of the Bible, the echoes of the gospel are already present. And that's why we're doing this series. That's why we want to look at the story of the Bible as a whole. Because it all fits together and the story of the Bible is our story. Right? Just like the people of Israel, we desperately need a Messiah too. To rescue us, to deliver us from our own rebellion and from the messes that we make of our own lives. We too need to believe that God is going to be faithful and will hold up his part of the covenant, that he will come through on the binding promise that he made to save us and to put everything that was broken back together. Right? Like the people of Israel, our natural default is to just go through life as if we are in control and we are the ones setting the terms for how life is to be lived. But just like them, we fail, and we fail over and over again. And just like them, we are reminded at times that the control that we think we have over our lives, over our world, over our economy, is an illusion. But here's the thing. Here's the good news for us today. Because we live on this side of the cross, we already know that we can be forgiven when we mess things up. And that is true when we come to Jesus for the very first time and we invite him in as the Lord and the leader of our lives. And some of us who are listening today, we need to make that decision. And the events of recent weeks may have reminded us that we're not as in control as we think we are and that we stand in need of God's help and his rescue. But this promise, right, that forgiveness is there, it's also just as true for us who already follow Jesus and who fall short time and time again of his call on our lives. Because of the cross, We know that when we come to God and ask for his forgiveness, the price has already been paid. He has already done the work to hold up both ends of the covenant, even in spite of our failures. So as we finish up today, let's just take a moment 
and pray about how we need to respond. Uh, Let's pray that God will show us the ways that maybe we are trusting in our own power and going it on our own. And let's take the time to confess that and come back to him. Would you pray with me? God, I am so grateful um, that the way you inspired the Bible to come together, to be written, to tell this story, like it is a story that continues to speak to us today. Thank you, God, for the promise that we see here, for the reminder that you are faithful, that you are here for us, that you want to love us and forgive us and restore us, that you promise to provide for us, to care for us, to protect us in our need. God, we live in a broken and scary and messed up world, and you never promised that we were never gonna have to deal with those things, but you promised that you would be with us. That's what we saw there with with Moses and the tablets and the commandments. It was the promise to be with the people. So God, would you help us know what we need to do with what we have heard today? Would you point out to us the ways that we are falling short of your design for our life, of the things that you are calling us to do? And would you remind us, Lord, of your incredible faithfulness, that that even from before the beginning of time, you knew that we were not going to get this right, and you had a plan in place for that, that through the life and the death and the resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ, you made a way for us to come back to you no matter what we have done. God, in light of that grace, would you help each of us know what we need to do to, to put what we have heard about and talked about today into action in our own lives in such a way that we live differently tomorrow than we do right now. We trust that through the power of your Holy Spirit, you can help each one of us do that. And we ask these things in your son's name. Amen. Well, thank you for taking the time to be with us today in this admittedly different kind of online format. Um, As we prepare to close, just the one thing that I want to ask you to do, if you're watching with a friend or a family member or some folks in your small group, whatever that might be, I just would encourage you to, before you you move on to the rest of your day, just take a little bit of time and and talk about what we discussed today. Uh, Maybe God spoke something to you and you can share about that together. Uh, Maybe there is a clear action step that he's calling you to take in light of what we've heard. And and maybe you could just share that with some people and and you could pray for each other that God's strength would help you do that. And you know, if you're watching it alone, I would encourage you to go to our Facebook page and connect with some people there who can hear what God is saying to you and, and encourage and pray for you in this time. We're grateful you took the time to be with us today and we look forward to seeing you here again next week. Have a fantastic day.